There we go. This on YouTube. We'll still get started shortly. We could. We the, should. A bunch of them will be here this semester. Yeah. I could ask Heba to move into class 106. All right. It's like we've been trying it. We're doing, we do the lecture during 12 hour because okay. the students are in the studio and trying to make it because we do it after school. Yeah, they want to yeah. get out. I was like that too. Yeah. yeah. All right. Hi, everybody. Hi. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> um, Thank you so much for joining us for our second lecture of the semester. I want to begin today with it being Indigenous Day with the land um, acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the land on which we stand is the ancestral his territory of the Lenape people. We pay respect to Indigenous people throughout the Lenape di diaspora, past, present, and future, and honor those who've been historically and systematically disenfranchised. I probably honestly should be starting every lecture with that. Um, but just a note of Indigenous Day, uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. So one thing I also want to make note is our next lectures, just switching gears. On uh, October 23rd, we'll have Andrea Theodorides um, from United Atmospheres joining us. Um, on October 30th, our own Sarah Roll Bergeron. And then on November 6th, Bellman Freeman from Bellman Freeman Architects. And then on November 27th, Laura Del Pino, um, from Casa Architecture and also from Kane. Um, but first, before we get started with the lecture, I would really like to introduce our speaker today, Mark Gardner. Um, Mark, applause. <laughs> Mark is a principal at New York City based Jack Lish Gardner Architects, an award winning design practice and studio that works across scales from product design to interiors to buildings. Mark has led many of JGA's design initiatives and works to best understand the role of design as a social practice. The firm has won, uh, has won an AI National Honor Award and numerous AI New York Design Awards. Um, and the practice recently worked with a nonprofit partner on a honeybee study center in Dodoma, Tanzania, which I think you're speaking about in your lecture. Yeah. <laughs> Mark is currently an associate professor of Architectural Practices Society at Parsons, and uh, we're very glad for you to join us today. Thank you so much for the for the invitation to to speak today. Um, it's it is really really an honor. Um, it is Indigenous Peoples Day, and so. Uh, there are a lot of ways I can sort of I can talk about our work, the work that my practice does, Jack Litch Gardner. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about it in a in a different way, um, not one that I'm not used to. I'm used to it. Uh, sometimes I share it, sometimes I don't. Um, it's always sort of a struggle. Um, the work itself is a struggle, um, but. Some of the projects I'm going to show you today are are based around the idea of restorative justice, and that takes different forms. Sometimes it's uh, cultural. Um, sometimes it's ecological uh, around adaptive reuse. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll start there. The I see the materials for building. See the difficulties too and the obstacles. 
The mind seeks a way to overcome those obstacles. The hands seek tools to cut the wood, to till the soil, and harness the power of the waters. Then the hand seeks other hands to help, a community of hands to help. Thus, the dream becomes not one man's dream alone, but a community's dream. Not my dream alone, but our dream. Not my world alone, but your world and my world, belonging to all the hands who build. That's Langston Hughes from Freedom Plow. A lot of the ways that my partner and I, Stephen Jacklers, think about our work is that we, we try to approach it with some very sort of key themes. Um, we think about uh, a lot of these photos you'll see are um, from our travels. We think travel is very important. We think observation, seeing the world. Um, and so some of these themes are uh, ways that we are a ways of seeing for us. Um, we like thinking about a sense of place, how architecture can serve a, a purpose. Is there clarity of design? Does it invite the user, the reader, the person visiting um, to inhabit, to stay and understand? And this is a, uh, a phrase I use a lot in the in the up in the corner is the uh, B center that I'll be showing you. With that particular client, she sort of you know nothing that we had said to her, but one of the first conversations we had, she talked about the women that she works with um, as having businesses and talked about the dignity of the user that whatever we designed should bring dignity to the enterprise that they were undertaking, that it should honor them. How do you engage the senses with materials, um, with elements? And architectural delight, it's sort of a Vitruvian term. A lot of times we find ourselves, um, especially for myself, looking at uh, art. Um, thinking about, if I'm thinking about some of the projects that I'm going to show you, uh, how would I approach it in terms of um, giving a message, giving a clear message, actually capturing a cultural moment? Um, how might it best be at the heart of contemporary debate about identity, social cohesion, and the development of of knowledge-based economies. How does it sort of capture the moment um, of the world that we inhabit? Um, some of these are the work I'm showing now is a series from uh, an exhibition, A World in Common, that's contemporary African uh, photography. It's um, now on at the Tate Modern. But how do you begin to sort of capture the elemental forms of, um, of cultural identity? And at the same time, this is a photograph around uh, Afrofuturism. Um, capture that moment that's yet to come and, and be relevant to a future user. Um, this first project I'll show, I don't, I, I'll admit I don't have a, a lot to show for it. It's a project for a developer in Philadelphia, uh, National Real Estate and Frontier Development, which is a black owned, um, Frontier is a black owned hospitality group. And the city put out a, a response for um, a new, uh, a new development that would to, that would take on the family courts building that's on Logan Circle in Philadelphia. And that building has been abandoned for a number of years. It's on the National Register. Part of what they asked for was a hotel and an African-American museum in the building. One of the ways that our group initially approached it, we did the walkthrough and we thought, 
an African American building and a courts building. You know, an African American museum, a neo colonial building, a building that had that separated black families, a building that had incarceration, has a jail in the basement. A building where I could keep going, a building where because it's a historical, you're limited about the signage you can put out front. So the museum would have been lost in there. So our team actually put forward an idea, and that was you are the city, uh, we presented this to the city, you're the city of Philadelphia. I'm showing some different, among them, the National uh, African American Museum on the Mall, the latest, the International African American Museum in Charleston, which is in the top corner over here. Um, other cities like Pittsburgh that have cultural centers, Baltimore. I mean, I'm not dissing on any other city, but for the crowd in Philadelphia, I was like, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, and you don't have a standalone African American building, given that you have uh, Marian Anderson, Octavius Cato. You know, names that I could just I could just keep going with the history of James Fortin, right? The names that have influenced and not only were founding fathers, black founding fathers that helped build this country. And so this is the building that the museum finds itself in now. Um, it's terrible. I'll say it. It was nice at the time. It was done in seven, uh, I was almost said 1776. It was, it was done for the bicentennial in 1976. It was done in 1975. And uh, over time, it's off the, it's off the mall, Independence Mall. It's on Arch Street, if you know Philadelphia. But where it is, is it's behind, see a theme here? It's behind the federal court buildings. It's next to the federal prison. It's not the right place for a cultural institution. It should be on the Independence Mall with the other. And if not there, then on then on the parkway, the Benjamin Franklin Parkway with the other cultural institutions, the Franklin Institute, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Rocky Stairs, uh, the Rodin Museum, the Barnes, Right, so we were asked, we presented that to them, you know. Um, it's an interesting story because initially they weren't accepting of it, we dropped out, the team dropped out. The city asked us to come back and in doing so, and even now after we've, we won the competition, okay, but even now there's still negotiations going on with the city, even though there was a, I say that because there was a public announcement, so I think I can, can kind of say that, but they're still negotiating these things. It's a large development over, you know, millions of square feet, including besides, Amp, it would be a mid-rise tower, housing, hotels, uh, a family center for the free library. So a lot of things sort of going on here. So anyway, this was, this was the development. So I'm only going to show just some outside pictures. We just worked in concept around it. But the idea was that it was a building representative of, you know, we started thinking about the metal work, the iron workers in, in uh, Philadelphia, that a lot of the uh, old iron works where enslaved and free blacks worked as artisans to create, um, to create iron work that went around the city and as well as the brick work. And so we're looking at this as either, this was still up in the air, either as a sort of metal skin or maybe terracotta. Um, right now you're seeing sort of a bronze skin on it with a, a inner layer that would be lit because you have programs inside that just the galleries and all that don't need direct light. This is looking at it from to the side is going to be like looking past this, the barns is like right to the right. Um, and then this is the family center connected to the back of the free library. And then you just catching the corner of the entry 
um, into the into the African American Museum. And then within the development site, where there would be a large um, inner courtyard with developer, you know, the sort of retail businesses uh, with um, housing. Um, they do a mix of affordable and market rate housing to help uh, finance the, the development and also provide funds off of that that would help pay for these amenity spaces, including the AMP. So that, that would be from the parkway. The other development that's now happening is the Calder Gardens, which is the Herzog and Dimeron project is the, you're, you're almost looking from that site um, toward, toward AMP. So this project is, you know, I, I, I threw it in here that the press conference was just like at the end of August, you know, a month has gone by, it'll still be a few months before we sort of move forward with any sort of more con conceptual work. Then this is, um, this is the project that I think Steph and I, uh, credit has really sort of turning around the, you know, the practice in a lot of ways. And by that, I mean, having people think about us in different ways. Maybe I need to give a little history to explain that. We were always sort of known as, um, retail. I could have shown a, quite a few retail projects here. Like I said, I can describe us in a lot of different ways. We, we did work for Mark Jacobs for a number of years, um, did projects for them all over the world. And we also did housing. Uh, we did single family houses, apartments. People never really knew us for the housing. They always sort of knew the retail work. Um, and so, I guess when you go overboard, you got to go way overboard. So we did, we actually, this was a start off as a pro bono project where I was approached by a, a friend who does beekeeping. My, um, my business partner, Stefan is a beekeeper. Um, and so we were approached by a client who runs a nonprofit who was saying, well, I have this cooperative of like 15,000 beekeepers in Tanzania and we actually need to provide them with a gathering space. So this is a beekeeper sanctuary, not for the bees, but for the beekeepers, um, located in central, in central Tanzania, um, serving an area. If you see on the map here, going to the north and to the west, um, all of that area is where all of those beekeepers are. And so this was sort of a central hub near the administrative capital for them to come to, to sell their goods, to get uh, supplies. And a lot of these beekeepers, that's the client in the photograph in the center. Um, you can tell she's the white woman right in the middle. Uh, and with a, a lot of the beekeepers, right? What do you notice? Women, right? A lot of women run businesses and refer to it as be, you know, beekeepers love their little puns, but it was honey money, right? So they were, we're going to make some honey money. And the honey money was really based around, and, and so different groups, village groups, um, tribal groups, you see the Maasai women there. Um, and I'm just going to stop a minute and say the Maasai, like the colors that were amazing. Uh, one quick story is I'm talking with one of the women in the um, in the photo and this guy who was a shepherd was coming up and he was in red and it was the brightest red I'd ever seen. I was like, wow, that red is fantastic. But right after I noticed the red, I noticed the, the Jordan shoes he was wearing. And I was like, what? <laughs> um, very cool. Um, but anyway, that group, they, so they do beekeeping as well as, um, farming, subsistence farming, but the, the beekeeping was actually um, a money-making enterprise for them, right? So they're, they're able to, they said, hey, we have the bees doing the work and we make the money. And all kinds of bee products that would go out 
So the center was supposed to actually be, so for the Yuki Safari, that's B in Swahili. Um, so they would have the Safari, I went on the Safari, uh, and saw all kinds, of, strangely enough, there are all kinds of bees. They're stingless bees that make the, if you Google this, they make the weirdest hives that are like, it's something out of alien. <laughs> um, but the honey is amazing. Uh, so they're all different. You think there's just one like, oh, the African bee. Yeah, there's the African bee, but there's all different kinds of bees, different kinds of honey, um, and different kinds of honey based around the ecology. So conservation also came into this. This was where the group was also concerned about uh, deforestation. Right, and, and the first line of defense against that deforestation are these villagers who live in the area that would notice that their bees would have to travel further and further distances for their food or not make a lot of food, right? Which meant that they weren't able to, um, that certain plants were being cleared out or certain trees were being taken down, the acacia, uh, you know, the weirdest thing is the, the baobab, but they wouldn't touch, people wouldn't touch that so um, because it's sacred. And so they have, in these areas, they have enough food to last them even through until it gets to the rainy season. So the center would actually have a number of components. And I always say we learned from the bees, there was no way no way I was going to make a hive building, like, you know, <laughs> hey, look, it's bees. They're like little hive forms. All... But we did learn from the bees in that when they talked about they wanted an enterprise that grew, how could we, with different program needing different sizes, how could we start to sort of Tetris that together, right? Start to tile those things and put the different, not just we had a matrix to a spreadsheet where if certain other program moved out and was, you know, we built new space, then they could actually do other programs. And so this is from a photograph of the site. You see it's sort of semi-arid. Um, the only, I don't see the trees around. There's a tree on the site, but it's a baobab. So it's pretty much cleared out. But we would actually make the, you get the color because we would actually be making the brick from the soil. Um, so it would feel like, right, that sense of place we talked about, where the, the, that it was actually the building was coming out of the location. And we had a number of spaces for formal meetings, informal meetings, um, areas for the market um, where people could meet and um, have conversations, learn from each other. Um, one of the things that Mary, the client, found that was striking was, you know, she showed the the women that she was working with, you know, what she could sell um, the honey for in the U.S. or in Europe. And they kind of, like she said, the reaction was always the same. They'd be like, a, oh, okay, what? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> you know, like, it just, you know. It amazed them, and it was like for the co-op, all that would come back into the co-op and and be distributed among its 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 members. And so, thinking about that as a place of learning for a future generation to to sort of carry on the tradition. This is a project. So now we're. Um, we're working on Governor's Island and in, in uh, New York Harbor. Uh, we just started a, um, this was building 20, 20 Nolan Park. It's a series of officer, former officers' houses. I guess I should start off and say Governor's Island was purchased from the federal government, it had been an army base, Coast Guard station, and then was purchased by the city of New York and the state of New York from the federal government for a dollar. And in that covenant, there couldn't be housing placed on the site. People couldn't live there full time, so you wouldn't get developers coming in and putting market housing. There couldn't be 
any more power generated than the island itself would use. So that meant you couldn't put a power plant on the island. Uh, at one point, I think there had been a study probably in the 40s, 30s, that was for an airport that could go there. There had been planes had landed there during the during World War II. Um, that was also sort of like off the, you know, like, no. Um, and so the trust that took over the go governor's island actually was stuck with a, what is our mission, right? They decided that it was really going to be around sustainability. Um, it was going to become a park. So they built the hills that are on the south side of the island for, for people to come visit. You can ride your bike around the island. It becomes a recreational and leisure space. But apart from that, they had development zones. And those development zones, one just was released. It was just a press announcement. They're doing a climate center, right, which is... Um, I'm not sure if I remember Stony Brook and some other, anyway, doing a group, a consortium that would actually create this climate center um, and run it on the develop, first development site of the island. There's, but that still leaves, um, let me go forward, that still leaves the north side of the island. So the area I'm talking about is sort of off the, pictures of the south side, but the north side is actually the historic part of the island. And the area I'm talking about is the historic houses. So those were the officers' houses. You could see the star. That's the fort, um, the battery that's up in the corner there, the ferry landing that's just off from the fort. And those areas are controlled. The fort and the battery are controlled by the federal government still but the city and the state actually run the rest, but it still has historical oversight. So what do you do with these houses? So we're actually doing a study now to look at how the houses can, um, as we've started the first one, we're starting the second house, how they can become um, sustainable, managed in terms of materials, managed in terms of adaptive reuse. So they're going to be turned into offices for nonprofits. The first one we worked on will be turned over some point early next year for Billion Oyster Project and NYU will take office space um, in this building. And one of the ways that we looked at it, we said, well, you know, in our proposal, we said, you know, historic preservation is tough. You have to have a certain mindset about it. A lot of people are like, oh, you know, we have to restore it to its, you know, you know, its former glory, which probably never existed. I'll get to that a little later, which probably never existed in that state or try to save it as an example of, um, say, architecture of a certain style and period. Um, for us, we were talking about these officers' houses as having the potential of not being looked at as these sort of monuments the exterior had to be preserved. But we also how you run into problems because first is there wasn't such a care for accessibility. So then how do you start to bring in accessibility? The second is um, energy standards are much higher. So those, those idea of energy standards and sustainability run into each other with preservation and the interior, the Department of Interior standards. Right, the windows, single pane, single pane. Um, so all that's been sort of a struggle as we're working through that and as we're trying to create a, a master plan. This is, um, I hate saying master plan, I don't know why I just said that, strategic plan. I keep saying strategic plan. The client says master plan, I say strategic plan. That's a problem. Um, the So this is a rendering of where we, we sort of are with the house and the next one, that's sort of the state it's in. Um, we're trying to restore it. It's got, you know, asbestos, lead, all that's been sort of remediated. Um, we're restoring the windows, but we're actually putting in, um, we're, we're double glazing, glazing them. And so we're trying to get an energy efficiency to them, uh, and also provide for, we've left the, I wish I could describe this. We've left the porch intact in a lot of ways historically, but we've raised the floor level 
so that actually we kind of hide some of the ramp so we didn't have to have a long ramp around so that everybody, whether you come up the front steps or you come this way, everyone enters from the same entrance and exits the same way. And so we did some, you know, different programs and how, um, how it could be used by these different groups. They'll come in and sort of finish it themselves. Uh, this is sort of, we worked with Atelier 10, um, who is our sustainability consultant and looked at how we might, um, you know, how we might have a, a fan to sort of pull through radi you know, radiant heat floors, um, how we might get in an energy efficiency, how in the summer we might create a cross breeze so the windows can be open, um, to cool, um, and make use of that porch and the overhangs. And then this is w w where we've sort of taken away um, the ground floor, provided for some some framing, but then still have um, some traces of what the former house looked like, where the walls were, where the stairs were. And trying to keep some of the original framing just as a, um, really sort of as a more of a revealing what the the house is doing and also hiding some of those mechanicals and roofing uh, in the attic area above that because we have such you know a lot of space in the ceiling but we couldn't make use of it so we just opened it up to open up the space okay um so i'm going to take a break from a projects that we worked on and talk about more of my interest and in things that I'm involved in. So part of um, I hope this sort of leads into the project that follows it. I'm uh, the church I grew up in in Williamsburg, Virginia dates back to 1776. It's one of the oldest black churches in the country. In fact, uh, when the African American Museum opened, President Obama rang the bell from our church. Um, this goes to issues within a community. So this, you're looking at part of the outline of an old church. Let's see. An old church that exists on site. This photo is probably from about 1900, 1902. Uh, this was the church and it existed. This particular church existed until 1950. Six. My parents, at my age, my parents, my dad was old enough to have gone, been raised, born, raised, went to this church. When Colonial Williamsburg was sort of redoing the, it's an ongoing project, redoing the, the historic area. Everybody know what Colonial Williamsburg is? Okay, I don't need to. So, because if I had to explain it. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Colonial Williamsburg was trying to recapture the period in the 1700s, um, you know, at the dawn of the revolution. Um, and Williamsburg had been the colonial capital of Virginia. So this church existed on the site when the Colonial Williamsburg made a swap because it's on a main thoroughfare coming in and they didn't want this church, even though this particular church dated to 1850s. So it was 100 years old at that but it didn't match their time period they were redoing. So they did a land swap and moved the church out to a outer area outside the colonial restored area and tore this church down. Decades go by, right? There's a plaque out, but the plaque in the shows it was like, the plaque was like over here off the picture. And they said, that's where the church was. And members of the church, my dad included, were like, no, no, the church was actually closer to the, it was over here. And Colonel Williamsburg for the longest time was like, no, no, I think we, look, we have a map. And I was like, that map's wrong. I went to the church. This is about voices being heard. I went to the church, it was here. No, no, the map says it was over there. So finally, I think after the, you know, I said Obama rang the bell, there was a foundation the church formed, money came in the church formed a foundation, money came in, and then we said, the church was over there. 
and Colonel Williamsburg went, well, we ought to do some archaeology and sort of see. Well, the church was over there, <laughs> right? They, so they found it. But not only did they, they do that, they went deeper, and they found the 1804 church. And they know there was something else on the site before that, right? Uh, and not only that, they found 63 grave sites, which people didn't know were there, that existed there. Um, I'm on the descendants committee, and so it's an interesting story. If you want to follow it, there's a whole, like you can Google it, the Washington Post has a whole series on it. Um, the descendants committee decided we were going to open up some of these sites some of these grave sites because, you know, as on the descendants committee, my family is a sort of founding family in the church. And those were probably people related to me. So we did DNA testing and conclusive. They knew they were, they could sort of say, male 30s died from this probably, definitely African descent. Um, they also found a it was a young girl who was a teenager, um, was one of the other sites. Uh, what, had ha what happened, the site where the grave site was, Colonial Williamsburg for years had had a parking lot there and let the touring buses park there and they, they would run in the summer, you know, to keep the bus cool, right, for the visitors that were coming. They just absolutely destroyed, they, that vibration destroyed all the graves below ground. So there was no use in, there was no use in actually trying to, you know, we were asked that we'd open three. We were asked again, do you want to go back and do more? There were some people that wanted to do more, like I want to find out, but knowing that that was a fact that that had happened and that you were probably getting the most, these were outliers anyway, and they were not in great shape. Um, I was among those that voted and said, let them rest. Right. So that just is, I, I mention this because sometimes the things that you, where your interests are, and the things you get involved in, actually become a project unto themselves, right? And also, lead you into um, lead you into other areas. So this is a project. This is the last one that I'll I'll be presenting. Um, this is the uh, Inwood Sacred Site. Inwood is a neighborhood that as far up as you can go in Manhattan at the very tip at the end, right? Is um, Inwood. And this site is the uh, Right now, as you can see, it's like, it's been cleared. Um, Bowery Residence Committee, BRC, as a nonprofit developer, is actually building a, a transitional shelter on the site. But one of the things that happened was the community, remember I said about listening to voices, right? The community came in and said, hey, you know there was a burial ground on this site. And there was also Lenape villages in the area. Um, and this was a considered a sacred place. Um, and as a single, I have an image of it. There was a hill there with a a tree. So that's the that's the location. That's a sort of historic map showing. It shows it shows the you see the little crosses. It shows the cemetery. Um, this is a photo from the New York Times from, I think, about, from 1900. And the, because the 10th Avenue was going through, they actually wanted to, they took down, the, they moved the cemetery. Moved it. They removed it. Where some of the, where some of the, um, uh, bones from went, they, we've been talking about it, but went to the Museum of Natural History um, for a eugen eugenics study. Anybody know what eugenics is? The measuring of the skull size 
to under between races to understand intelligence. Right. So these were they were endemic. They, these were Africans. This is the part I had gone to. This this burial site dates to Dutch times. So these were enslaved people who were brought over by the Dutch who were African. Right. Now the team I'm working with Elizabeth Kennedy, who's a landscape architect, and Joe Baker, um, who's an artist, who runs the Lenape Center. Um, we're working as a collaborative team to try to best sort of understand the site, how to sort of honor it. The BRC has given over a space, uh, a courtyard space and an interior space that's on two levels because the street kind of goes uphill. Um, and so we've been asked to look at it and create some sort of sacred memorial space. And how do you start to do that? Well, we started looking at, you know, as I talked about looking at art, looking at beading, um, looking at things sort of between the culture. And that, that's not to say we were going to mix up the culture, make some kind of, you know, mixture of like, oh, this is Lenape and this is African and this is this area of Africa and that area of Africa. But simply just to understand like how we could start to think about the elemental forms. Um, this is um, also some of the work that um, Joe does and artists that work with the Lenape Center do. Um, thinking about what our aspirations might be in terms of of weaving, of, of materials. We know we were digging into the ground, maybe a canvas floor, or maybe a poured wall that's, you know, rammed earth or, or concrete that feels strided in different layers to think about, to get people to remember that this was a burial site in the ground and it had been excavated and the earth has been moved and it's no longer in the same place as it was in 1900 or in 1680. And so also thinking about art and how art coincides with nature. And then thinking about um, we a mound, uh, it's the same as the, their mounds at the African burial ground in lower Manhattan um, that, that Elizabeth had worked on. And so we've been sort of thinking about this. And then thinking about also, like I said, the ground is no longer in the same place. This was during the time when this was the 10th Avenue kind of coming through. That's a tree that was on the side of the hill. Um, you see part of the hill sort of gone or dug out where the, where the, the burial sites were. And so we're right next to the 10th Avenue, the subway line. Um, and we're looking at trying to create something that calls attention to itself as, as this is this important space. This is something, this is uh, for people to stop in their tracks and go, you know, what, what is that? Um, what's going on there? Um, and so we're looking at this. We're still in development. This is concept. We just had a presentation to part of the community group. We have more coming. So. Um, I, I feel fortunate that I can show this to you. Um, there's a we're also backed up to a school, and so the grade changes, and there's a fence back there. So how do we kind of that's not on the property? So how do we start to hide or cover that? And then thinking about again the sort of beating. This is Joe Baker's work, and as you come in the entry hall. Uh, surprise, there's no work by Joe Baker yet. He is, he is still working on it. The red area, though, and the portal, which is here, that sort of weird surface, is where he's working. But I can say I know he's thinking about the tree and roots and how it starts to maybe be embedded in the wall to talk a little bit about time and ground. Um, and that's sacred. He was like, that's sacred for us, Lenape, and, and so the, the tree. And so how do we start to, to honor that? And so that's the space as you come in. 
and then as you pass through the portal, this is the space. So then, yeah. So then this is the uh, space that you come into. There were 36 grave sites, so we have these reliquaries and these niches um, that would hold. We put aside soil that would hold soil from the site, um, honoring the 36 um, grave sites that were there. Um, you you ramp down because it's you know on a different level to get to the courtyard. So it's this journey um, that you begin to take as that movement between the from the physical world as you pass through that portal into the spiritual. And you're always sort of focused. This is back from the portal. You're always sort of focused on the mound. Um, we're still unclear. We may do reburial at that point. Um, that's the intention. Uh, and this is just sort of what the reliquaries start to would be like. Set in the wall. And as you make this journey and travel down to the courtyard, And sort of be in that that space, and they would have ceremonies, gatherings here to sort of honor the ancestors, whether they'd be, you know, enslaved Africans or Lenape. And we're still, you know, like I said, we're still in concept. It's still sort of being being worked out, but thank you. Thank you so much for your incredible <laughs> <laughs> and we're done. Uh, are, there, are there any questions? Oh, come on, the light. Yeah. For someone else, Paul. Well, I have a I have a question. Oh yeah. yeah. I did, I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. This question for you is how is your how should a professional artistic program at the Mississippi Preservation Oh. And the, oh, this is not from the Thank you. Well, I, I think we take a particular approach to preservation and that I, I believe that it shouldn't. Um, it's, it depends on where your focus is on on the work that you're doing. There's certain things I can understand where it's like you want to um, preserve it to talk about a style, right? We talk about that, like the painted ladies and so you know, particular style, and you just want to say like, hey, remember this, you know, kind of thing. But then there are also those the the preservation can also mean those to the things I'm sort of showing can also mean those sites. Like the church, the church that uh, we were showing that was torn down. So the ultimately what I didn't share was the older, the 1804 church, which was just really a one-room colonial box, is actually being rebuilt. Um, and and then there'll also be a memorial for the grave sites on the site. And the Tony Winsworth also added the... I can't think of the name of it, but there's a, there was a school that actually, believe it or not, that actually educated free and, and, and enslaved black children um, that's been placed on the site. So all of that is a chance to really tell the whole story, or more, I shouldn't say the whole story, but more of the story that's been, that's been told. So I think any program teaching, it's like, you're going to have to sort of take, there's that sort of technical aspect of, of um, conservation, what I might call heritage conservation, right? There's the technical aspect of it, but then there's also um, teaching about the, 
the very thing with which I think might be more important the very thing that you're kind of what are you trying to say with what you're doing in terms of preservation right whose voice is in who who's in the room who's being allowed to sort of tell the story and, and who isn't there No, I was curious, you know, right, so who's telling the story, if you could talk about how how you're able to ensure that the right voices are at the table um, as part of the process, because some of these sites are so um, contentious. contentious. So I wonder, like, how do you ensure Always that those voices are, yeah. are at the table? Uh, you, <laughs> you try your hardest. To make sure that that anyone that's been mentioned that first off like that's an easy one like if some group or someone's being mentioned or talked about and they're not there they should be there right but I think part of it is also that especially coming I could use Inwood as an example like I'm not a resident there I don't live there I don't you know I know some people that live there but they probably aren't so I don't know if they're interested in the project or not but I'm dependent on the client and the client's consultant who they bought in to say like, and we've sat and met with community groups and done Zoom meetings with community groups and mm -hmm. they've done their homework in terms of trying to, to talk to people. Now, some people will come out and say, well, no one asked me kind of thing. And it's, it's difficult. You just, you know, you, you, there's an effort between there's a difference between the effort to try and to reach out and to be ignored right and so if you're going to ignore it and you don't want to come to the table then you don't really know how that conversation's going and how you could affect it I was actually going to ask a very related question, which was how the community is is receiving the, the last project that you saw, because I think it's important to hear how is that dialogue going? Yeah. You know, yeah. is, it, is it going well? Is it contentious? Is there lots of work? Is there a little more massage? You know, you said you were in, in contest. And yes, 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 and <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All, all of that, it's like, it's not, it's not just like a clear, yeah, no. Yes, okay, we showed them nice, glossy renderings, and they're totally on board. It's actually a dialogue that takes there's, a long time. There's a dialogue. Back and forth. There's always a dialogue, and there is, um, and I mean this in a lot of ways, all of this, all of this work, there's always a struggle. There's your personal struggle with the design and how you're, you know, are you taking everything in? Are you, what are you leaving behind? What do you, if you go this direction, but you can't do that? And so there's that, there's your own. Then there's, oh, I have to be, you know, I'm, it's funny because I'm actually thinking of Charles Ames' uh, diagram that he had about, like, um, it was this sort of amoeba. He meant it to be, it was static, it was a drawing, but he meant it to be dynamic because it's always moving always moving right here's where I want to work in this it was a Venn diagram but it was like an amoeba here's where I want to work and I want to do this and do this over here here's society telling me the regulations the laws the limits the site the insurance the all of these other things that come into it and then there's what the client wants also so you could replace society with community also in there and so you're always trying to find the place where everyone meets. Mm -hmm. Do you always do that, honestly? No. I've been on projects where I thought we were, I thought I was listening and hearing and somehow missed something. And, and, and never, for me, never purposefully, never, you know, with any vindictiveness of like, well, they're great, I'm not going to do that, you know, kind of thing. Or, But I'm always res try to be respectful to say, even if it's something that I know, like, well, by code, we can't, but here I'm going to show you and I'm going to explain why we can't do that and what if we try it in these other ways? Does that get at what you're doing? Because 
a lot of time you're working with, and especially with communities, people who've never worked with an architect or a designer or, you know, I mean, I'm finding that with the Let It Ring Foundation in Williamsburg. It's like I'm on a board with people that have maybe they've built for their organization, for the city or whatever, but they've never been in this position. And so they never sure, well, what are we going to do here? What does this mean? Or what does a memorial mean? So then you're kind of actually trying to get at very basic questions. What does it mean to honor those people who were buried here? What does that look like? You know, and somebody said, I thought there was a member of the church who's older and she said, um, who's also on the board and she said such a wonderful thing. She was just like, all I want is just to see a bench out there where I can sit and talk to them. I was like, that's beautiful. That is beautiful. That's exactly, you know, it should be about the the feelings, the like what um, what you're trying to evoke from a design. And sometimes it's like, sometimes you try to be too complex with it. Sometimes it's a very simple, it's a very simple thing, but a very beautiful and elegant thing. Yeah, but I think that there's like a compromise that needs to happen always between all yes. the different parties and you find the best way forward even <laughs> Compromise and you try to have all these voices represented, but the process in and of itself has some compromise. Right. Not everybody feels like they want it. Yes, everything works. Right. Everything exactly how I wanted it, and then you kind of explain it to people. Right. And then time, and then at that point, time will tell how it's thought of, received. You know, it's like I always say. I think I said to somebody. They were, we were looking at something, somebody else who was on the board, and they were like, well, that's ugly. And I said, you know, they said that about the Eiffel Tower. Didn't you just go to Paris and say the Eiffel Tower was beautiful? But people <laughs> thought that was ugly, you know? And it's like, really? So it's like, yeah, you know, maybe it's, it, you got to have to, that's a hard thing to try to get people to sort of delve into those feelings. Like somebody can just say something, but it's like, what's behind that? I'm always sort of like, you never... No one told me in school that it's like I'd have to be, you know, I used to joke with clients and say, oh, you want the mind reader fee, you know? <laughs> like, I got to guess what you mean by that. It's like, you know, I want a bathroom. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know what a bathroom looks like. What the hell is this stone? And it's like, you said you want a bathroom. Stone feels so cold. Oh, okay. So we do have very specific, you have something in your head that you think I see, but I I can't, you know, mm -hmm. you have to tell me, you have to use language, you have to tell me. Well, I think we're out of time. Okay. Okay, one more. Right, thank you. <laughs> um, before the deep of the project, you mentioned uh, uh, the possibility for it to expand in the future. Um, it springs to mind that another project that is in Rwanda, the Zikara uh, Hospital. Yes, um, by Mass. Like, yeah. I think from the story there, um, like they have like, they train the villagers, the, the local people there, how to construct the structure so that whenever yeah. they left, they wouldn't need to like consult like another, like kind of like Western, like not or Rwanda or whatever, mm -hmm. architect to kind of continue on that mission of it. Right. Is there anything similar that you guys have in mind for the beekeeper sanctuary, like as a way of like kind of training the women potentially in like construction techniques? But I also noticed like the, the walls you mentioned were like made from the ground, but then there's like this fancy kind of like steel roof structure. Uh, the, the roof structure would be built by a, we had a company that was, um, that would come in and actually build that roof structure and then the structures underneath would be built by the, by the local okay. group. Um, we, we, at one point we started like, I don't know why we were like, oh, wood, and then it was like, oh, that's stupid, you know, because <laughs> they're gonna, you know, and then the, even the local guy was just like, Mark, they're gonna take the wood and burn it and they have, you know, it's like nobody's building with, look around, nobody's building with wood, they're building with, you know, cast, you know, concrete or they're dealing with brick or masonry, right? So we would definitely have, the plan was to have there was a local partner and we talked to local vendors, especially, they do some nice work and so I went to and saw some of the local guys who were like building walls and stuff and it, that's we took a lot of that what we were doing from from the work they were doing so it would be easy for them to the, to build and kind of advance that. Yeah. Thank you. Sure.
Thank you. I think the C of NJT is here on the panel of NJT for the 50th. No, I don't think so. I hope not. I hope not. Because I say yes.